if you want to get a hold of me or you're ever interested in uh, in any of the conversations that I've had with you or the topics that I've covered, feel free to email me at matthewadaptalon.com. You can also tweet me at, at MatthewMcD and follow me on my blog at ableblue.com slash blog. A lot of the content that I present in my seminars is presented as blog posts. And um, if you're ever trying to follow up on the links or the documentation that I've put together, you'll find that on my blog. And also, if you're interested in my photography, that's Golden Dog Ruby on Instagram. And that's my girl. She's underneath my desk right now. I'm also a Microsoft MVP for Office, Ser Office Servers and Services. I'm an instructor for Pluralsight and the World Education Alliance. The World Education Alliance is three companies that have come together, which is Combined Knowledge, who's hosting this for me, as well as Mindsharp and Critical Path Training. So I teach for all of them, and I uh, specialize in SharePoint and Office 365. I'm also a consultant for Aptalon, where I deliver Office 365 and SharePoint technologies for my customers. So today we're going to be talking about an update for hybrid, where we are in the big picture of hybrid with Office 365. The thing that's amazing about this is it's very much a moving target. Um, they are rolling out new features for Office 365 all the time. And SharePoint on-prem as a hybrid connection is a really important part of that strategy. We'll talk a little bit about the hybrid prerequisites. And these are not so much a feature by feature, prerequisites, but just general conversation that you need to have with your IT department to be sure that they're prepared for what it takes to get a hybrid deployment going. We'll talk a little bit about hybrid authentication. I'll get on my soapbox about the end user experience for hybrid authentication and some of the horrible tragedies I've seen related to hybrid auth. Then we'll talk about specific hybrid scenarios. And I'm not going to go real deep on this particular session, but I do have a link for my next webinar where we'll go deep on search and taxonomy. And then finally, I'll just have some notes about managing your hybrid tenant. So what is hybrid? Well, in Microsoft's world, hybrid environment is when you have your content in both an Office 365 tenant as well as SharePoint on-premises, possibly even your file shares, things like that, that we're able to pull together into a unified experience, a cohesive experience for your end users. The hybrid workloads that are available to you right now are actually, this is a really amazing slide. I've built this slide several times since uh, 2005, I'm sorry, 2015, and it just keeps growing. So we talk about hybrid OneDrive. So this is personal sites in the cloud. This is get rid of your on-premises storage for your personal sites and have that hosted in Office 365 instead. The other thing that you get with hybrid OneDrive is hybrid redirection. So this allows the end users to click on a MySite link or a, um, a, a OneDrive link, and it takes them to Office 365. And that's why the hybrid authentication is so important. We want to make sure that that's seamless. We've also got this notion of hybrid sites, and I'll talk about that. I'll make a little fun of it because it's sort of a marketing term about how we view the collection of sites that we're associated with. Hybrid B2B extranet, again, a little bit markety, but what that is, is external sharing. So this is an option that you already have. There are no prerequisites for this. You simply have to know how to configure your Office 365 tenant to allow or deny external sharing in order to execute on hybrid extranet. But there's also some really cool new features that they've added to Azure and Azure AD to allow sharing externally, not only of SharePoint, but of other apps that you may have associated with your Azure AD um, environment. Hybrid search, definitely one of my more favorite topics. Hybrid search is the ability to have Office 365 host your index and then bind your on-premises search environment to that index so that you no longer have to host an indexing infrastructure internally. You don't have to host the servers to support that indexing infrastructure. You simply need to crawl your on-premises content and allow it to flow to Office 365 for indexing. The hybrid profile redirect is using the Delve profile rather than 
your on-premises OneDrive profile or your what used to be known as your MySite profile and it's had a lot of different names but essentially this is saying anytime an end user clicks on a link to be able to view your profile they'll be taken to your um, your Delve Office 365 profile instead. The Hybrid Extensible App Launcher gets the award for the longest name of our hybrid features. And that's simply the ability to create an environment where I can create new tiles in Office 365 and then have those tiles pushed to all of the app launchers that my users are using as well as down to our on-premises app launcher. So now I can create a link to, let's say, my on-premises intranet and have that link everywhere the end user goes and all they're doing is clicking on the waffle. Modern attachments with Exchange and OneDrive for Business has been around for quite a while. The notion of modern attachments is simply this. Let's store the document on the user's OneDrive for Business and rather than send an email, send an email with an attachment, let's send an email with a link instead. That way we only have one version of the document rather than 27 versions of the document and we can establish a collaborative environment with our email rather than sending these attachments through Exchange. Hybrid Taxonomy is one of the newer features that's been released into Preview. And um, Hybrid Taxonomy allows us to have um, the managed metadata service in Office 365, send its information down to all of our SharePoint farms on premises, and have a single source of, hybrid ta of taxonomy for our managed metadata. We also have a new feature called hybrid auditing. This is very much in preview right now, and um, I'll demonstrate it near the end of the end of the session. But essentially, what we're doing is we're sending our usage information from our on-premises farm up to Office 365, where it can then be commingled with all of our auditing information in the Security and Compliance Center, so I can look for um, events, specific events associated with, if I want to, specific users or simply look for things like who sent a sharing message, who has received a sharing message and acted on it, who has uploaded or deleted a document, and that's what the hybrid auditing is all about, is I already have the Security and Compliance Center in Office 365, but now let's feed data from our on-premises farms into that, um, into that data store so that I can search across all of my tenants. And then finally, hybrid self-service site creation. Hybrid self-service site creation allows us to create a link, either on-premises or in Office 365, that offers our end users a choice. Do they want to create a site on-prem or do they want to create a site online? Or do I want to modify that workflow myself so that I can offer my end users additional choices and then send them to Office 365 or keep them on-prem depending on things that I might configure into Office 365. Like for instance, I might want to say if you have a high business impact or if it's a legal issue, that stays on-prem. But if it's um, low business impact or needs to be shared externally, then that goes into Office 365. So these are the suites of different um, these are the suites of different workloads that are available to you when you go hybrid with Office 365. The, um, the prerequisites to make this happen are mostly around, initially, getting your Active Directory domain so that it can synchronize properly with Office 365. So we need an on-prem Active Directory domain services domain. It has to be at a forest functional level of Windows Server 2008 through Windows Server 2012 R2. And then of course it's SharePoint, so we need a SharePoint 2013 or 2016 farm. And that farm has to be configured specifically or have certain services available that I'll review in just a second. You also need an Office 365 tenant. Now this can be an E1, an E3, an E4. Essentially any Office 365 tenant that supports SharePoint will support an on-premises to Office 365 hybrid configuration. Now for SharePoint, you need to have a managed metadata service application, you need to have a user profile service application and support my sites. Even though we're doing a redirect, 
the link and the availability of my sites is still important for the hybrid um, communications for things like OneDrive and sites. We need an app management service and you also need the Microsoft SharePoint Foundation subscription setting service. So all of these things have to be up and running prior to establishing a connection with Office 365. Now if we look at each workload that I've mentioned previously, each workload has a specific um, prerequisite as well. The interesting thing you'll notice is that SharePoint 2016 has a lot of these prerequisites already built in at the RTM level until we get to features like hybrid taxonomy and hybrid auditing which require feature pack one or what's also known as the November 2016 public update. For SharePoint 2013 we've got service pack one for OneDrive and then sites require the July 2016 public update. Hybrid extranet you'll notice that there's no um, that it's just RTM because there really is no prerequisite in either build for hybrid extranet because it's a out-of-the-box Office 365 capability. Now hybrid search requires uh, SP1 and plus you need the January 2016 CUs that actually really gets you up to the best best in available bits for um, hybrid search. And it just moves on down the line. Now when we get to hybrid self-service site creation Currently, this has only been released for SharePoint Server 2013. Self-service site creation in, um, in a hybrid capacity is not currently available for SharePoint Server 2016, but we're looking for that date to be sometime this, later this year for SharePoint Server 2016. It was just a bit more important for Microsoft to get that working in, in SharePoint Server 2013 first, since they have a much larger install base. Now, if you ever have seen a hybrid presentation, you've probably seen some flavor of this slide. And I love this slide because, and I'll make fun of my consulting friends, this makes you feel like a consultant because it's a cool build and it's important. The thing you need to know is this slide is now, well, mine is up to date and I'm not sure that everybody's is, but I want to walk through kind of what the connections are that you're going to be creating so that even if you don't understand all of the pieces, at least you get a sense of what's needed to make certain things work. So the first thing that's needed to make things work is you need to have Azure Active Directory Connect working so that your on-premises identities are being synchronized with Azure AD. That's a requirement so that you can establish single sign-on, which we'll talk about in just a second. But it also is established, it's also required so that search works correctly because search is security trimmed depending on where your search is coming from. Um, SharePoint search is either going to use the local Active Directory server or the remote Azure AD directory services. And so this is a really critical part to get right. The next bit is the Azure ACS Trust. Now this is established by any of the scripts or the hybrid picker when you set them up. So this is actually not something that you need to physically do, but it does get created for you when you make a hybrid connection. You can do it manually, but um, it, it does happen with the hybrid picker. That's the, one of the nice things about using some of the automation that Microsoft has developed around hybrid. The next thing is this one. And for a lot of companies, this is where they balk because they don't necessarily have an ADFS server infrastructure. They're not using Active Directory Federation services yet. So this is a stumbling block. And I'll talk about what Microsoft has done to make that easier in just a second. The last bit is optional but makes for a much better service, a much better search experience. And that's a reverse proxy server back to your office online server in your on-premises infrastructure. And what that allows us to do is if we are in um, Office 365 and we do a search and we find content from our on-premises SharePoint farm, the reverse proxy allows us to show those previews from the Office 365 Search Center. So if you're not worried about previews, you don't have to worry about this particular connection. But if you do want to have a seamless environment where you have previews from Office 365 as well as previews from your on-premises content, you do need this reverse proxy configured to be able to show that content. Now, one of the big updates came down um, a couple of months ago, and that is the new um, Azure AD Connect synchronization service allows us to create something called the Azure AD Connect SSO, or what's called pass-through authentication. 
I'll demonstrate this in just a second, but this is a nice alternative for companies that don't necessarily have to worry about um, remote workers or traveling workers that would authenticate back through ADFS. If you're using a domain joined machine and you're either on your, on your domain or you are uh, VPN in, then this Azure AD Connect service works very well. And like I said, I'll demonstrate this in just a second. So from a security perspective, if, um, if you want to configure hybrid, if you want to run the hybrid picker and configure these hybrid workloads, you need to be a member of the SharePoint Farm Administrators Group. You have to have full control of the local user profile service. You also have to have an account that is a global administrator in Office 365. You have to be logged into Office 365 and SharePoint at the same time, which means that you would log into your SharePoint server and then log into Office 365 from there because the hybrid picker is going to drop um, an installer onto your SharePoint box and do all of the configuration for you. So you have to be on that machine to make those, um, to make those connections work. And then finally, you have to be able to launch the hybrid picker um, as a farm administrator with elevated privileges. Once you're able to do all of that, you can simply run the picker to choose the workloads that you want to choose. For the hybrid picker, it goes through a series of prerequisites. It does kind of a health check for you, if you will. It checks that your server farm exists. That's kind of nice to know. It makes sure that you're a farm administrator. It makes sure that your SharePoint farm version matches the function that you're trying to configure. So if you remember back to the grid that I just showed you for each function, it's verifying that you're at the right patch level for that feature to work. It also verifies that the app management service and user profile service are online. And then it runs some PowerShell to make sure that it knows where your MySite host URL is so that it can set up those links as well. There is one gotcha that I want to warn you about. And that's when you run the hybrid picker, it actually is going to change your um, out-of-the-box farm realm. So when you install SharePoint, SharePoint grabs a, a globally unique ID and assigns it to your SharePoint farm as the realm ID. When you configure hybrid, it changes the realm ID to match your tenant in Office 365. If you have already provisioned provider hosted apps, so SharePoint apps, access services or workflow manager for uh, 2013 style workflows, the authentication realm changing is going to break those three things. So you just need to fix it. So the way that you do that is you re-register access services, you re-register workflow manager, and you re-register your provider hosted apps. The workaround for this is don't set those up until you have hybrid configured. Once you have hybrid configured, then come back and set up all of these services and you'll be fine. The fact is it only causes a problem if you have pre-provisioned and set these, these up so that they're using the existing auth realm and then we change that auth realm. But this is, um, there's a lot of documentation from Microsoft on how to fix this if you've, if you've run into this issue. Okay. So let's talk about domain synchronization. This is kind of the, the linchpin of making everything work the way that we want it to work. I like to say that you have a couple of different authentication options, but then I'm going to get on my soapbox and talk about what I like and don't like. The first one is when an, an IT department that doesn't really know Office 365 is sort of thrown into, hey, set this up. And so in the first scenario, I work for a company called mydomain.com. And what they did was they went into Office 365 and they set up um, our domain as my impossibly long domain. And then they do nothing else. So our end users now have two completely different identities. They have Matthew at mydomain.com. And then when they go to Office 365, they log in as Matthew at my impossibly long domain on Microsoft.com. Now, some of you are probably rolling your eyes saying that would never happen, but I have seen this happen over and over and over again. And that's that companies don't even know that you can register your own domain with Microsoft and use that as your login. So I say, if you're in this situation, just say no, stop. You're not ready for hybrid. What you want to do is you want to use directory synchronization. 
By using directory synchronization, the user accounts from your local Active Directory are mirrored in Azure AD. Now you have an option for password synchronization, but I think password synchronization is critical to make this work well, because that way the end user uses their same domain credentials, whether they're in Office 365 or working on-prem. They don't have to remember two different, two different passwords. They, the password, if they change it on-prem, will be changed within the next synchronization cycle in Office 365. So you can configure this, and it's trivially easy to do. They've made it very easy with the onboarding process. Now, the next thing you have to consider is how are you going to do single sign-on, or are you going to do single sign-on? Now, my favorite way of getting into um, um, Office 365 is using single sign-on. So, originally, we had this choice of Active Directory Federation services, which meant standing up additional hardware and software. But we can also do this new feature that's in preview right now called pass-through authentication. And what pass-through authentication does is establish a trust relationship between Office 365 and our local environment. It doesn't require us to open any firewall ports at all. And once we've established that trust, we can send a Kerberos ticket to Office 365 and get single sign-on. But let me show you what this looks like. So here I am in a um, just a local Windows 10 machine. And I'm going to open um, Internet Explorer. This is logging me into my local SharePoint environment. If I go to Office 365 simply by typing the URL, what it will do is bring me to the Office login page. It's going to recognize that I'm Holly. I'm going to click the link and then watch what happens. What should happen here is it should just redirect me without asking me for my password and take me right into Office 365. Now this is not saved credentials in the browser. This is single sign-on. And one of the things that you can do if you choose to is you can actually create redirects so that your end users, rather than typing adatum945, can type something like sharepoint.adatum.com and have a redirect that sends them here because when you do the redirect, one of the choices you have is to send the home realm with that redirect. And when you do that, Microsoft, or, uh, Office 365 knows where you're coming from, and it will bypass the whole login page for you. So there's ways to configure this to make it so easy for your end users to get through. And the worst case scenario is that they just have to click their name in the browser to get them all the way through to Office 365. And so this is using Kerberos authentication or Kerberos authentication to get me through to Office 365 by simply having that, um, that configuration set up using Azure Active Directory synchronization. And it works just as well in, uh, in Chrome. If I come here and open a new window in Chrome, <laughs> Uh, later on, I'll have a blog post about why I'm getting these support ticket links. <laughs> it's actually kind of a funny story, um, but uh, I'll save that for another time. Okay, so here I am again on my intranet, my Adatum intranet. I'm in Chrome. And if I do Adatum, it's going to take me to the login page. I click on Holly and I wait for just a second, it redirects me. Now, if my local account, if my domain account didn't have the proper authentication or the proper authority to get to this site, this wouldn't work, okay? So all of the, uh, you have to have the directory synchronization working and the accounts, the, uh, the users have to be allowed into the sites, but this will work for, um, for any of the sites that they go to in Office 365. It's just a great way to set up the ability to move from place to place. Okay, so that's fairly recent. Group-based licensing has just come out. And so if you've seen blog posts on how to, how to uh, do use PowerShell to license groups of users and things like that, I want you to forget those because this is the coolest thing I've seen in a while. 
And I got to thank Scott Hogue. I have a link at the end of the uh, at the end of the session uh, to his podcast. But I got to thank thank Scott Hogue for showing me this. So this is group based licensing. And what this is is if I go into Azure. So here I am in my Azure Active Directory, which you get with Office 365 and um, and your uh, well, right now it's in preview, but eventually we'll get it with E3s and above. Um, at least that's what they're saying. So here I am in users and groups in, Active, in Azure Active Directory. And so what I've set up is if I go to groups and I look at my groups, this Office 365 pilot team is actually coming from my on-premises environment. I synchronized those groups with Azure AD. And I do that by using my Azure AD sync client. So what I'm going to do now is go back on-prem and I'm going to show you in my domain controller that I have in IT, I have this Office 365 pilot team. Okay, and right now there's just two people in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take AMR here and I'm going to add him to my Office 365 pilot team. And what's going to happen is because I have... Um, Office 365 licenses associated with that group in Office 365, which if I come in here and I look at this Office 365 pilot team, and I look at the licenses, what I've done is associated Office 365 Enterprise E3 with anybody who is in the Office 360, or who, anybody who's in the um, pilot team group. So again, I hate to jump around a bunch, but if I jump back over to Office 365, here's my admin center, and I go into users, if I go into users, what you'll see here is I have some users that are licensed for Office 365, but my my uh, my AMR guy, this guy right here, he's unlicensed, and actually so is Godwell. So let's go ahead and add them to our on-premises. Let's add them. So here's uh, AMR, and let's add. Godwell, choose OK there. So now they're in this Office 365 pilot team group. The next thing that has to happen is that our synchronization server, which is running Azure AD Sync, has to run a sync cycle. So I'm just going to force that sync cycle, and it is going to synchronize those users to Office 365. They've already been synchronized. You saw their user accounts. But this is going to tell Azure AD that they're actually in that um, in that group. So I'm going to go back up to Azure AD, and if I look at the members of this group, there they are. So now Godwell and Ammer are part of our Azure AD or our Office 365 pilot team. And what I did was I set up for this group automatic licensing. And by setting up that automatic licensing, they are now going, it usually takes about a minute or so once that's happened, to, um, to uh, have their licenses applied. And so we'll come back here and we'll refresh this. And what we should see is that our licenses get applied. So what this means is that you can now manage your Office 365 licenses by using local on-premises security groups. And as you put people in one group or another, like let's say that you were going to have a seasonal employees group that was only in Office 365 and maybe didn't have Yammer and some of the other features. Well, you can set your licensing up that way so that only specific groups get specific licenses. And so if our demo works here, then uh, what we should see is we should see that we've got um, those guys licensed correctly. 
and it's being coy with me. Come on, you can do it. And there they are. So here's AMR and here's Godwell. They both have their licenses. And so I didn't have to do anything. I didn't, I mean, all I had to do on prem was add those users to that group. And then in Azure AD, I had already assigned the Office 365 Enterprise E3 to that security group in Azure AD. So as soon as the users show up, Azure takes care of the licensing for me. So that's how you want to be managing your users. Now we're going to look at features. So OneDrive, hybrid OneDrive, is essentially personal sites in SharePoint Online. That's really what we're talking about. And this feature has been around for quite a while. It's one of the first workloads to hit the hybrid world. One of the nice things about it is that the hybrid connection manages that my site URL redirection and we get a terabyte minimum, a terabyte per user storage. That's a lot of storage considering if you were going to host that on-prem. Now, they've just announced, and this is fairly new, the new administrative controls for sharing and device access. And so now there's a OneDrive admin center that allows you to control things like who can you share with? What file types are you allowed to share? Um, how is synchronization handled? Are you going to allow synchronization to non-domain joined machines? A big consideration. You may want to only allow files to be synchronized with domain joined machines. You can now control that. You can also control the storage, so maybe you don't want everybody to have a terabyte. You can control that storage yourself using this hybrid OneDrive admin center. You also have capabilities for device access and compliance and, and notification as well. But there's a lot of capability built into the admin center. Now, just I think it was just yesterday, Bill Baer and his team uh, had announced that um, Hashtag and, and uh, percent sign are supported in file names in OneDrive for Business, but the announcement yesterday is that the file path length is increased from 256 to 400 characters. This, is, uh, this allows us to have much longer file names and deeper nested um, file folders in our OneDrive for Business. Um, so I think it's a really important thing that they've added this capability. Now, hybrid sites is probably the one that my customers misunderstand the most, and it has to do with that word sites. Hybrid sites is not team sites, okay? It's just a bad name for the fact that what we're doing is we're taking the sites page off of our on-premises environment and pushing it up to Office 365. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, anytime you follow a document or a site, in SharePoint, it shows up on this site's page. And so now what we have is the ability to share, or I'm sorry, to follow content from our on-premises environment and have those links show up on our site's page in Office 365. They've also added the extensible app launcher. So what we can do is in Office 365, we can add a custom tile. You need the name of the tile, you need a URL to the title, and when you do that, you should make sure that that, title, that tile image is uh, available from any URL in any domain. And then you set up the image. Now the users need to have an Exchange Online mailbox for this to work, and they have to sign into that mailbox at least once. And you, if you want to, you can have different experiences. So on-prem is different than Office 365. But most of my customers that are interested in this want to have that on-prem um, launcher show up with the same link from their Office 365 app launcher. And so this is the end user experience that we're shooting for. And that's having, if I have the image, the icon, and the tile in Office 365, I want to have the same thing show up on our sites. And so what we're looking at for this hybrid app launcher, if I go back to uh, Launch CL1, and I, I will admit that it's a little flaky right now. It's, um, it's not working quite as well as, as I'd like. So I've had some mixed, uh, mixed capability. But here I am in uh, a datum, and actually, if I just uh, if I go from here, here's my app launcher. I can open the app launcher, and over here on my new tab is where I see a datum intranet, and this is where if you hadn't already pinned it, it would say pin to home. And as soon as you say pin to home for our custom uh, intranet tile, it will then show up in the app launcher down here um, as a custom tile. So I can click that link. And it's going to take me to my on-premises environment. And then from here, 
And this is where I've been having some trouble today in this demo. And part of the reason why you saw that um, why you saw that support ticket, one of the reasons, is it will eventually show up right out here on the uh, on the end. And there's a little JavaScript you can run to try to clear your cache. I've tried that. So there's a few other issues I need to work with. But the idea is that then your end users would be able to move from place to place. Now, if I go back to my sites page, this is that hybrid sites feature. And that's taking me to my, uh, my SharePoint page in Office 365. And this is where you'll see that the sites that I'm following, like Adatum Intranet, this came from my intranet. If I have documents and other sites locally that I've shared, um, then they will show up in this location. Um, and I have a single place where I can go get to the sites that I'm following. And that's kind of what's nice about that is that your end users, again, have a single place to go to get the information they need from Office 365 or on-prem. So hybrid search is one of my favorite features. Um, it is fairly misunderstood still, so I wanted to, wanted to call attention to some of the terminology here. Hybrid federated search is two separate indexes. This is the way it was with the original implementation of hybrid. There was no single index, and this was a really disjointed um, end user experience because the results are not commingled. You end up with two separate result pages, essentially. With the new version that's, that was released in late uh, 2015, you have one index in SharePoint Online. The content from SharePoint uh, Server on-prem is pushed to Office 365 as indexable material. Those, that index is built, and then we're querying from one index. That way the results the rele are relevance ranked together, and they are commingled. The beauty of this is that if I have multiple SharePoint farms around the world, I can have each of, those con each of those farms crawl themselves and push all of that content into Office 365. Then I can search from any of those locations or from Office 365 and find any content that I have access to. Security trimming is still in place. This just means that I can decrease my infrastructure for crawl and for index and not crawl each other's farms. I can simply push all the content up to Office 365 for a single view of my search results. Now going along with that is this feature of hybrid taxonomy. Hybrid taxonomy is the synchronization of two or more term stores. So again, multi-farm with a single SharePoint tenant. What you do is you establish a, um, you know, a lot of companies have already established a term set that they want to use. And so what we do is we take that term set and the group that it's involved with, and we run an initial synchronization that is essentially just a copy up to Office 365. And now that copy, the thing that's important about that is that the, the global unique IDs are maintained. And so now if I do, uh, if, if I have the permissions set correctly, which there is a little adjustment you need to do because the Office 365 term store doesn't know about local permissions, you need to make sure that your term store administrators are, are set with Office 365 identities. And once you've done that, there's a timer job that runs on-prem that pulls the globally unique IDs and the term sets down so any new terms that get added to Office 365 are automatically kept in sync with all farms that are running that timer job. But this only applies to term groups. It doesn't apply to content types. So if you're familiar with the uh, with the term store you, or with the um, managed metadata service, you know that it also handles content type syndication. This service does not do that. It is only hybrid taxonomy. So when we look at using these two items together, the end result is something actually kind of cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on my sites page here and kind of show you the, the, the search progression that Microsoft has developed up to this point. So here, if I search for project, I'll see the fields. I'll see some, some documents that I have access to. If I choose show more results, this is going to do a more exhaustive search, maybe find sites as well as files. But then if I go all the way down to the bottom, I can go back to classic results. And this is going to take me to the traditional SharePoint 2013 search center. And so what I've done here, and I've got a webinar coming up where I'll talk more about this, is I have these project documents showing.
And if I choose to uh, filter these documents or refine on those taxonomy terms that are being shared between the two environments, like in this case, I'll choose just documents related to golden retrievers. If I choose that link, and if my demo works for me, there it goes, what you'll notice is I've refined on a term, but I've gotten results from both my SharePoint online site as well as my SharePoint on-prem site. Okay, so this is the power of those that combine taxonomy, the ability to search across your environments, your Office 365 and your SharePoint environments using a single taxonomy and then refine on that. The other thing that I can do is when I search across, I'm going to choose all here to, to show you more results, is I can also use additional refinement or a, um, a managed property to say, well, what if I only want on-premise on premises content? Well, I've created a search um, um, vertical here called local results. So you'll notice that all of the results are from intranet.adatum. If I say, you know what, I know it's in Office 365, I can choose the Office 365 results page, and that's going to show me only items in Office 365. So even though I have a hybrid environment, I can also teach my users how to slice and dice across those environments to help them find what they're looking for. Hybrid taxonomy is a big part of that, but also just being smart about how you configure your search center makes it easier as well. The next webinar I do, two weeks from today, is going to be all about configuring SharePoint hybrid search and taxonomy. We'll go deep into how I did those configurations and how we make that work. If you're interested in, log in signing up for that, you can follow this bit.ly. It is a bit.ly, so it is case sensitive, but it's WEA for World Education Alliance, hybrid webinars. It'll take you right to this page, or you can just sign up with the page you use to get to this one today. So the last two features I want to talk about, the first is self-service site creation. Again, self-service site collection creation is only available in SharePoint 2013, and the availability for SharePoint 2016 is loosely later this year. But essentially what it does is it allows you to, to um, check a checkbox that says we're going to create site collections in, on SharePoint Online. And when they do that, when an end user goes to create a new site, they'll be prompted for the kind of site that they want, and then walk through a wizard to allow them to provision. There's capability in, built into this for extensibility in case you want to do a little bit more work in that workflow. Look for this to be released to SharePoint 2016 later in the year. The last feature is unified auditing. And so unified auditing allows us to send SharePoint online, I'm sorry, SharePoint on-prem usage logs up to Office 365 for them to be parsed and made available as part of the Office 365 Security and Compliance Center. So what we do is we do an audit log search and then we're able to find specific actions if we choose a user by a specific user or just in general find out what's going on both in our Office 365 as well as our SharePoint on-prem environments. And so in, um, in our case, if I'm logged in here as Holly, and I want to I want to view what's going on with my environment, I can come up here, I can go down to my admin center. And then in my admin center, the security and compliance center is an is an additional sort of sub admin center. And so we're gonna in the in the navigation here, we're gonna go down to our admin centers, and we're going to choose the Security and Compliance Center. This is going to open a new window to take us to protection.office.com. And, um, and once we're authenticated, what I will be able to do is actually perform an audit log search looking for um, items that, have, uh, that are of, of importance to me. So I go into Search and Investigation, and I go into Audit Log Search. Now, I will warn you if you want to use this, um, you have to come here. And then there will be a dialogue that says, do you want to turn on audit log searching? Once you do that, it takes about 24 to 48 hours for everything to get spun up and working. But once you've configured hybrid audit log, 
every 30 minutes your logs are pushed up to Office 365. So they're swept up, they're pushed into Office 365, and so usually you'll start seeing entries within 35 to 45 minutes after they have taken after they've taken effect. But let me show you what you can do. So let me see if I can take care of some screen real estate here. So what I'm going to do is choose some activities. Um, let's say I want to um, look at people who have uploaded a file, deleted a file. Notice there's a lot of actions in here that I can look for. I can also look for accepted sharing requests, which is a real powerful one if you're using OneDrive for Business or you're using uh, SharePoint as an extranet. You can look at who has accepted access requests, who has accepted sharing invitations from outside your domain, uh, things like that. Um, but what I'm going to do is just click up here. This is for the last uh, five days or so. I can identify specific users if I want, but I'm simply going to choose search. And then what this will show me is the actions that have taken place um, based on the current, uh, based on my current filter of deleting and uploading files. And there they are. So here, Holly uploaded Project Brain Freeze, Project Barnstorm, Research Budget, etc. The, the current build does have an issue that I want to point out that they're working on, and that's you'll notice that this is Holly's fully qualified domain name, which is awesome. But in the when you push your on-prem uh, audit logs, you'll notice that this says adatum slash Brad. So what they're working on right now is resolving that Brad into his cloud identity so that you'll be able to search for everything Brad has done today current build you can't do that but um, that's definitely one of the high priority things that they're working on to make the audit log search much more functional okay so I have a course coming up um, and that is uh, configuring SharePoint and Office 365 workloads where we'll spend three days and you'll walk through from beginning to end configuring seven of these hybrid workloads yourself as well as doing all of the domain configuration and um, doing the uh, directory synchronization for, syn for single sign-on. Um, we're doing the class from the 5th to the 7th of June. That says EMEA because the time that we're doing it is going to be catered to the work day in Europe. So if you're an early riser and you're in, you're in the United States, you're welcome to join with me because I'm going to be getting up really, really early. Uh, if you're not an early riser and want it to be during a U.S. work day, then that would be July 17th through 19th. We'll be doing the course again. Again, it's all online, three days, hands-on labs, where you'll be um, logging into our multi-server farm and you'll be able to configure all of this yourself. If you use the discount code RubiesDad, you'll get 10% off on that course. And then I'm also going to be at the conference in uh, Harlem, Netherlands, which is just outside of Amsterdam. It's a beautiful little city. Um, and that's the Office 365 Engage conference where I'll be doing this uh, hybrid workloads as a one-day workshop. Uh, it's not hands-on, but you'll get to watch me much more exhaustive demos and, um, and a lot more information on each of the workloads. We'll drill down deep, and it's a lot of fun. It's just a spectacular city if you're going to be in the area or interested. And that is, uh, you get a 20% discount if you use the code SPRMM. That's Matt McDermott. 464. I have no idea what the 464 is, but it's there. And so you can get to that through office365engage.com. There are some resources I want to call your attention to to help you with this um, as, you, as you work through your journey with uh, Office 365. The first is hybrid.office.com. It's the Hybrid Resource Center. It has links to tons of information. Uh, there's also um, um, this fantastic book put together by uh, Neil Hodgkinson, uh, Manas Biswas, and a bunch of other folks that did a great job. Absolutely the textbook for um, preparing your SharePoint hybrid environment. You can get to it on the bit.ly link, uh, MS Hybrid Book. Also released, uh, this came off of Bill Bear's blog just recently, is the Hybrid Scenarios Pocket Guide from Microsoft. Uh, you can get to that with this, uh, this Go link and um, um, really good information all, all wrapped up in a PDF that you can use for managing your hybrid scenarios. And then finally, I got to give a shout out to Scott Hogue. He gave me a bunch of information that really helped me out with the authentication and authorization part of this. And uh, he and Ben Stegink, who will be speaking with me at the 
uh, SharePoint Live 360 conference at the end of this year in Orlando, Florida has uh, their podcast, I think they're on episode three right now, uh, is msclouditpropodcast.com, and a fantastic podcast. And then, of course, uh, Combined Knowledge and MindSharp. Um, Bitly CK Hybrid Course will take you right to my class, but if you go to CombinedKnowledge.com or MindSharp.com, you'll be able to find the dates of all of the classes that we're doing. We do Office 365 courses for administrators. We do SharePoint, a five fantastic SharePoint on-prem administrator course if you're interested in that. And, of course, my new class, which will be releasing in June for, um, for Combined Knowledge. And of course, my blog, I'll leave this slide up, but I just want to thank you all. The uh, If you go to ableblue.com slash blog, you'll get all of the links that I had previously to uh, the different courses and the, uh, the different resources are all there in my latest blog post referencing this webinar. I hope you found this useful. It's, uh, it's a labor of love for me because I really enjoy teaching. I really enjoy this these hybrid capabilities and what they're able to offer my my uh, my customers and my clients. And plus, it's just it's just geeky, nerdy fun to get all this stuff put together. So, I hope you enjoyed this one. Like I said, the next webinar two weeks from today is going to be a deep dive into just SharePoint search. SharePoint Hybrid Search and Taxonomy together, and some of the considerations that you're going to want to make when you're when you're putting together your uh, your search environment in a hybrid way. So thank you guys so much. Um, oh hey Brian Alderman, thank you for reminding me. And um, uh, this Saturday, if you're in the SharePoint or uh, in the SharePoint area, if you're in the San Antonio area, or or Austin area is uh, SharePoint Saturday, San Antonio, and I'll be doing a uh, I'll be doing a presentation there as well as some of the other some of the uh, folks that are way smarter than me on things like SQL and things like that, like Brian Alderman. Um, it's going to be a great lineup. So thank you guys so much. I hope you have a great rest of your week, and hopefully I'll talk to you again in two weeks when we do the next pod next uh, broadcast. Thanks. <laughs>